This episode brought to you by Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer through Tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. It's My Right Stuff with your host, Grammy Award winning record producer and inventor, Toby Wright. is brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. I'm your announcer, Grinnin Barrett. Here's Toby. Hey, hey, and welcome back to another episode of My Right Stuff, which is a film, TV, sports, and adventure lifestyle podcast. And I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright. Well, on today's episode, we've been lucky enough to get a highly experienced music business professional, Daniel Heardman. But first, a big thanks to you, our loyal audience, who continue to watch, stream, and download every single episode of My Right Stuff. Keep spreading the word, my friends. I really appreciate it. And be sure to click on our show notes below and follow our link tree for a full list of channels we stream on as well as links to all of our sites and social media platforms, which, by the way, includes Gareth's show, Chunky's Choice Cuts, on our station, Radio Free Sealand. Click on our support link, which allows you to donate directly to our My Right Stuff crew. Every single dollar helps to bring you a brand new episode every week. And of course, be sure to subscribe to both of our YouTube channel and the podcast channel of your choice, so you never miss a single episode. And last, but certainly not least, please head on over to MyRightStuff.com and click on the store tab to pick up some hot merch and snazzy garb for those lovely bodies. All right, and please give a warm My Right Stuff welcome to Daniel Heardman. Hey, Daniel, what's happening? How are you today? Hey, thank you for inviting me over to your podcast. Oh, my pleasure. What? Uh, Everything's fine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's a it's a great day. And um, I just, you know, I wanted to invite you on the podcast to uh, educate some of our listeners on, you know, because I have a lot of artists um, that, you know, have been contacting me about how do, how do I get my music heard? And, you know, what's the best channels to do that? And is it CD Baby or Apple Music? Like, I'm so confused, so they tell me. So that's why I was, you know, um, reaching out to you, somebody in, you know, the, the distribution world who can maybe help you know, those people who can help us out and, or we can help them out, um, you know, and just educate them a little bit. But first, here on My Right Stuff, I'd like to get a little bit of history of, of you and for our listening audience. And um, I understand you first founded your own label in 94. Uh, can you tell us yeah, more about that's that? that's true. Oh, yeah, that's a long time ago. Uh, I was a little young 19-year-old guy. And um, I was walking, I'm, I'm from Hamburg, Germany, and I was walking down the famous vapor barn so the red light district, uh, and and I saw a little sticker on the wall saying, "Hey, we offer um, to basically put you on a CD, send you out to different music executives, try to get you some concerts, and uh, basically promote your band." And it had a very high price tag attached to it, and I I was thinking, "Huh, if they put like twenty bands on one of those compilation CDs, they make a ton of money. I think I can do it cheaper." And then I basically asked another, I don't, I don't, I think in the first one was like 10, 15 bands uh, of my friend bands. We all put money in together, um, printed the CD because back in the day there was no CD burners or anything. Right, so basically right. you either had to uh, copy a, a old uh, cassette or you had no chance of sending out your demos. And we all printed CDs together. Uh, sent them out and it was very successful. It ended up um, the first one already with um, a week of concerts with all those bands together in a club in Hamburg. And that was basically, yeah, the start of my label. That's awesome. 
And in 96, you started working as a booking agent, right? For like, you know, a lot of metal bands. And uh, yeah, that's... who are some of the bands you were able to book? And, and what, what venues were you associated with with those? I mean, um, as I said, um, I, I played metal music myself. So the, there was an ad in a, in a magazine that somebody was looking for, for a booking agent for their, for their agency. And I called the guy up and I, I, I expected to, to talk to like the secretary. So I, I thought like, okay, I have to be totally like over the top. And I said, Hey, I see you're looking for someone. I will be the best for the job you will ever find. And he was started to laugh and he said, why don't you come by tomorrow and we have a talk. And then, yeah, I started working pretty much a month later as an agent and we were very close connected to the metal scene and uh, mainly German European heavy metal bands. So some okay. of the bands you probably heard about are, are bands like Halloween, for example, or yes. uh, a lot of those, um, yeah, screaming metal bands back in the days. Oh, the Cookie Monster bands. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they like to sing like this. Oh. Yeah, we had a couple <laughs> of those as well, yeah. Yeah, I, lo- I love that shit. It's so fucking, it's just hard you know yeah it gets it's it gets some my yaya's out just listening to it you know yeah it's great it was it was a pretty interesting time because back in the day it was right around the the start of this wacken festival which is one of it's probably the the best known metal festival around the world every year they sell out basically a day before the 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 other festival starts and they have okay. the biggest bands in the world it's it's um I think always around 100, 125,000 people. And it's absolutely massive, absolutely crazy. And uh, back in the day, they were already a big festival, but we started working with them and we provided a couple of the bands. So it was, it was, very, it was very interesting because I started booking my first tour um, basically two weeks into the, into the tour, uh, into, into oh, the okay. work. It was, it was the Jim Rose Side Circus. I don't know if you know oh, those man. guys. I love Jim Rose. That was such an awesome little act. <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely crazy. That was it was it was it was absolutely um, amazing. Just being thrown in, and then I had to call up venues all over Germany without ever speaking to anyone. I had no idea how how to talk to the people. And I remember my boss back in the day. He put a little note over my head that uh, like on my on my desk that just said am because i was always like hey i would like to um talk to you um so i had a little <laughs> reminder not to say am all the time and it was like very uh, funny that's great so did you tour with any of those bands oh yeah basically um whenever i booked a tour i would tour manage the tour as well and okay. and um that was basically the thing that we did it, i think nine out of ten tours i tour managed as well and we always try to organize them in that way and um yeah I, I sometimes still tour manage i had my last my last tour managed gig with a friend band here from from germany that i tour managed in february last year right before corona hit 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 europe okay wow but that's more like a that's more like a, a fun thing i like doing oh it is a lot of fun so i bet you have some interesting or funny stories you can tell us about right Maybe share a story. Yeah, or two. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> come on. Of, of, of course. Everybody there's a lot loves of stories. to hear funny stories. You don't have to give any <laughs> names or anything, though. You know, just it's. Oh, the- I, I I give names. I have no problem. Oh, okay, with that. okay, okay. Everybody who everybody who does bullshit, I can I swear here. Oh, of course you can. Everybody who everybody who does bullshit has to has to live up to it. That's just what it is. Okay. So I think I think I think the craziest thing that I that I ever had in my life was working with a band called rock bitch okay and that's just the, it's just this this it's it's like an unbelievable uh in germany we say it's like a like a fl- flower bouquet of, of of funny stories okay because it was seven girls and one guy and the um idea behind the band was to fuck on stage okay and it was absolutely insane the stuff that happened on stage and off stage was absolutely crazy so it was it, it was impossible to sleep on the coach on the bus without having your butt to the wall 
Uh-huh. It was just, it was absolutely crazy. <laughs> it was, yeah. I remember one day, I, one one day we had this, um, we had this Turkish guy who was a, a bus driver. Okay. And he was totally like, well, what, what's happening? I can't look at this. It's all, it's crazy because all the girls were going, going nuts in the bus. Sure. And sometimes they had fans in, sometimes they didn't. And then one day I came into the bus and he was just taking a girl from behind and he was looking at me and he was just saying, if my dad finds out, he will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, it was it was it was it was an absolutely insane four years. And the band started out, they had a a showcase before we even had signed them to the booking agency in Amsterdam and they played uh the small Melkweg. I don't know if you've ever been, but it's it's no. it's about a capacity of like 500 600 people I would guess. Okay. And they sold it out instantly. It, it was it was um a crazy show as far as my boss told me. He just came back the next day and said I saw the craziest thing you would ever see. Okay. And then the first show we made was was a sold out venue, 1200 people. We had like 14 camera teams wanting to talk about them and gen- then it just grew from there and it ended up with them headlining Wacken Festival. So oh, wow. so Motorhead was supposed to be the headliner, okay. but then they basically, uh, they were supposed to be headlining in a tent and they said, we can't, we can't have them headline in the tent because they will rip the tent down if not everybody of those 80,000 people will fit. Right. So they had to put them on the main stage right after Motorhead and then Lemmy started uh, uh basically stayed on stage after the show and watched the show from side stage and um the band were famous for throwing a golden condom in the audience and whoever caught the golden condom would get a blowjob on stage oh okay so they would always get the audience member go into a little tent that they had set up normally behind the stage or on the side of the stage and then basically give the guy a blowjob and then um there was no time because the stage was so big. So the, the girl, Lucy, yeah, Lucy was, was the name of the girl. She just took the guy, placed him right next to Lemmy, started opening his pants and started doing her, her job. And this guy standing there in his motorhead shirt just looked up to Lemmy, looked up to his penis, looked up to Lemmy and was just like, I am so confused about this. I don't know where to look. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious! <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. There's a lot of those. Yeah. Oh, to tour in Europe, I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, it's not that free and easy here in the states, unfortunately. <laughs> no, we had we had our we had our fair share of problems. Oh yeah, there was a couple of concerts concerts they closed down, in particular because in Bavaria, them, yeah. where they are very. Yeah. 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 So I, I remember we had this one we had this one festival in in, in near Frankfurt, and um, the the whole festival was guarded by a group of it, it wasn't the Hell's Angels I think it was the 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 Motorcycle Club Bones. Okay. So they were guarding basically just like the old Stones concert. Right. They were guarding the front row and making sure nobody nobody did anything. And on the side stage was an official from the government, okay. basically with a with a light switch in his hand to shut down the, the concert if there was any stimulation going on on stage. Stimulation? And stimulation Sexual? Stimulation, stimulation meant, there was, they, they brought a catalog of definitions, meant rubbing a nipple more than five seconds <laughs> or, uh, or rubbing a clitoris more than three seconds, uh, stuff like that. So, so nudity was all fine. And the guy was just standing there next to the, to the local chapter leader of the bones <laughs> And then he had his this light switch in his hand, and at the end of the concert, he asked if he could make a photo with the band. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he forgot his stopwatch. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> How long are you rubbing that thing? Okay, that's four seconds up. Oh, we got to shut it down. That's fucking hilarious. Yes. <laughs> Well, let's get a little yeah, bit serious. Right, right. We'll get a little bit serious for a second. So it seems like you went back to the label side after after that and got involved with one of the most successful electronic and and club labels in Europe, right? And did you enjoy the club scene? Um, I mean, the whole the whole 
music label thing for me is more about about the artists than about the music itself. Okay. So I don't I don't really mind if it's if it's that kind of music, if it's if it's club music, if it's if it's metal. There's there's a lot of a lot of different things and I mean depending on the on the time period, you you had good times or you had bad times. Okay. So so yeah, I I mean um yeah, I would I would not I would not be able to 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 say which was the best period basically. That's okay. That's all right. As was, long as you enjoy it, it all, just, right? That's all that, you know, yeah. counts is you enjoy what you do and have fun doing it and, you know, you, it stimulates some some creativity and, you know, you're not one of those people that roll out of bed in the morning and go, "Oh, man, I have to go to work today." Jesus. Yeah. When no, Saturday that has coming. never happened. Yeah, see that's the thing yeah. is we all <laughs> when we follow our passions, we never get out of bed like that, right? We always get up and go, all right, what do I got to do today? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. so, but given that, like, you're so well-versed in distribution and stuff, can you tell us about how that works? Because I know, like I said earlier, you know, a bunch of my listeners have, have chimed in, like, how does all this work? And what is distribution? And, you know, how, how, how can it work for an outside artist? I think, um, I think it depends a little bit on, on the goal the first question i would always ask is if the goal is i want to make this my profession or if the goal is i want to have fun with it as long as it lasts okay because i think there's 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 two different two different ways to look at it one is um can be can be very driven by money one can be very driven by by having the most fun you can have and um for me that always it's always reflected in the question is it is music as a hobby or music as a profession? Right, and both have have uh, legitimate. Both are legitimate answers for me. Sure. Because even if it's a hobby, it can it be can it can be something that can be a lot of fun and that can be very successful. And then um, the next question would be: Do you want to go into the the widely successful area? I think then you will only be able to do it if you have a partner. And okay. um, that can be a label partner, that can be a publishing partner, but you need someone who believes in you, who can spread you out and get you into into um, yeah into the hands of people who actually have impact. And if if you are like I'm totally fine uh, distributing my music for myself because I want to build up maybe a fan base, and okay. there's a lot of options that you can do. So um, there's a lot of aggregators that have uh, opportunities. That as a as an as a solo artist or as a as a unknown group as a newcomer you can go to whether it's a CD baby or um, there's another one that I always keep forgetting here in Hamburg in Germany that's very successful and you can basically make a deal with them um, that they distribute your music out or they put it out to those different um, service providers like Audible and not Audible. Um, like Apple or iTunes, then um, you can Spotify have your music on whatever. Amazon, Spotify, and all of those. All of those. So okay. if you have, and then then basically um, you you decide you want to go the the digital way, and right. you might wanna wanna be okay with doing it that way. But if you wanna if you wanna be let's say in a, on a more widely successful way, I think it is important to have a partner to work with. So you should find a label, someone who has actually the impact to put okay. you into the hands of actually deciding people in the market. Because most of the time it's opportunities. Right. It's not, it's, 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 it's not, it's not necessarily the, the quality of the music. Okay. I've seen it so many times. I have this, this one friend uh, in, in Los Angeles, he basically signed a deal just to use their opportunities. He, he knew he could do it on his own okay. and he, he could do it very well on his own. But this label in, in, in Berlin was so well connected that as soon as he put his music out, each single would end up on all the big playlists. So he, oh, cool. he just, uh, he just, um, yeah, if you have a, a major playlist on Spotify, you can easily have, I don't know, 50, a hundred, 200, half a million new fans right. within right. a very short time. Right. It's crazy like that. Right. So what are the, yeah. some of the benefits of working with, or are there benefits to working with one distributor over another? 
Um, I think most of the time the people don't look at, 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 at the differences of the different companies. Right. But I, I realized that a lot of companies have like different um, things they offer. For example, there's this, this, this one company in Germany who also offer to print your CDs if somebody wants to buy them. Okay. So you can, you can, you can, you can sign up with them and then they will not only put your music uh, to Spotify, they will also put a finished CD um, on Amazon. And if somebody orders it, oh, they will print it exactly one time and then send it out to that, to that customer. And then you have an opportunity to basically exploit your music as a CD, um, as well and then of course it, it depends on what kind of rights you have to give them right so some some distributors will will ask you for for 10 percent but um will will not do any any other work some will even ask you for no money but ask for a fixed fee okay ask for maybe i don't know 35 to 50 50 dollars for an album and then you have to do everything on your own but there's also distributors who might ask you for 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 15 or 20 or maybe even 30 percent but they actually do a work they actually have opportunities to promote oh, so okay. um there's actually real people who who go into spotify and basically um promote the song so if you put out a new single there will be someone who who, who sends an email basically in the system to spotify and 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 recommends that song for one of those playlists because in, in, in digital distribution, it's all about the playlist when it comes to streaming. Right. right. That's just, it's, it's all about that. So that, yeah, exactly. And I've, I've noticed that myself. So if I'm a new artist and, you know, you just, you just told me that there's definitely differences between the distributors. And so I guess it depends on what I'm looking for as that artist, right? Like, you know, if I have 30% yeah. to give away, then I might go with that, that particular distribution company because they're going to offer more stuff. Um, as opposed to if I don't have that money or to give away, then I have to go with a lesser service distribu distributor, right? So what do you think is is, yeah, and is better? Do you think it's like better to have a, a combination of CDs and physical product uh, or is it, should we stay all digital? Uh, like, you know, it just seems like vinyl's coming back and I'm confused, yeah. man. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get it. And, and the, the, the market is very, very crazy about that because first of all, in the, in the United States, it's completely different than in Europe. Right. So if you, if you, if you, if you make metal music in Europe, you can still make a dime by selling physical CDs. Okay. I have a lot of friends who, 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 who print, I don't know, uh, a limited edition of 10,000 copies and they will sell it out in a week. And then um, wow. they 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 will have a lot of a lot of turnover. I think the, the 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 typical thing would be that you have like a limited edition um, box set that the super hyper fans the right. the 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 people you, every band that that makes sense to distribute will have a hundred or two hundred or maybe three hundred super hardcore fans, and if they are willing to spend thirty or forty euros on a on a big package then this can make a lot of a lot of turnover for a band right and and then there's the other aspect if you if you sell an album digitally you might get depending on your deal as i said and depending on the structure that a distribution label has for example there is distribution labels that offer you a deal for a fixed for for a flat fee okay but then in return um they that they have deals with the with with for example an itunes that only gives them 40 percent of the sales right so you get a hundred percent of something that is already very low right. and then there's maybe another one who says we want 30 percent but in return we have a really good deal with this company so maybe giving 30 percent away can even make you more money it sounds a little ridiculous but you 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 have to find out how their deals are and maybe even ask your friends what they make with those people get some get some reviews from bands that that work with a distributor and then check it out and then um it depends what your goal is right if you if you if if you're looking into a professional career building up a fan base if you think um you want to go out on tour 
then physical problem uh, 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 product can be very very helpful right but it will cost a lot of money to make and sure. somebody has to float that money and somebody has to trust enough that that money comes back in but on the other hand if you just go digital you have basically zero zero risk you cannot basically fail if even if if only 10 people listen to your music you get maybe a dollar at the end of the month right but but if you lose everything from printing physical products that is a different thing so i think it always depends on what your goal is understood so as a distributor how do you sign a band for a distribution deal? Like what's your criteria and what do you look for in an artist? I know you gave us some, a couple of uh, examples earlier. Um, so are, is that it? Uh, or are there more things that you look for besides what you mentioned before? I think, I think if you, if you don't sign a, sign a band as a label, so basically you, you own the master rights or you basically exploit the master rights. Right. If it's only about getting a share of the distribution income. Um, there's a lot of companies that make what we call basically an artist deal. So you basically okay. sign up to a distribution company and they say you pay, for example, 2000 euros or maybe 5000 euros, the same amount in dollars. And we, you will get a package. We will print 500 CDs for you. We will put them in the stores. We will make them available everywhere. We, in particular, put it onto Amazon because most physical sales still happen on Amazon. Right. And then we uh, we send out 100 or 200 CDs to different magazines and do a little promotion job. And then we also have a little maybe 500 euros for marketing in different magazines. So okay. you basically, you buy a package and then you get a package in return, but you stay your own label. And that yeah. is that can be very very successful okay. if you are willing to put the work in and um unfortunately most most of the bands look for a label because they don't want to do that part of the job right and i see more <laughs> i see more and more that the bands who are actually willing to do the work they are the ones who make it in the end and i think that's not a new thing I don't think I so think either. all the successful bands all over the time had their own labels owned their own masters Sure. And then made the right decisions, whether it's a band like the Beatles with with the Apple music, right. whether it's um, Swan Song from Led Zeppelin or Maverick from Madonna. Exactly. Everybody, everybody has their own way to make to to take a hold of their own. Or uh, what is it called? Black End Records from Metallica now. Right. Exactly. Took them years to get the get their rights back. Right. But but now they, they have money. all the money. That's yeah. right. It's and great. They, and they have complete control now too, which is the, the biggest thing for an artist, I think, is having creative control and just control over your own works. You know, that's that's the biggest Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. So, you know, I know you've done a lot of deals and are there any that you're most proud of? Um weirdly weirdly I'm I'm very proud of the very small ones. Okay. Because because I was working, for example, one of the bands that I'm the absolute proudest of, and they would not believe it's true, but it's, it is true, is a, <laughs> is a little band from Gothenburg in Sweden called MAN. Okay. And, and they made the craziest music you can imagine. So they put frets in between the frets on their guitar. So they called it 48 fret music metal. And they, when, they, when, they played, when they played, they sometimes would play a riff shifted by a microtone basically by right. by a uh, by by a quarter step right. and you would instantly feel seasick right. so it was just like their music was absolutely crazy you should look them up and and we put we put so much effort in the album we we spend a lot of money on that artwork and on the production and everything on the on the mix and the mastering they recorded in Sweden, but then um, Ulrich Wild mixed it, and okay. I think Maya Applebaum uh, uh, mastered, mastered it. it. Sure, and it was it was an absolute masterpiece, and I think we sold two hundred fifty copies. Oh wow! Okay, but but I am so proud of that album. It's crazy, because that was just it was just against all odds. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's 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 part that I'm very proud of, and. Another another 
product it always sounds degrading but it isn't meant like that another right. <laughs> another project i was i'm very proud of is a is a german project called ambra because they made it they made a stereophonic album and then my old boss in that old company that i was working with he he said it sounds it sounds like i don't know like out of noise meets alan parsons we should have oh, wow. like a five point a five point a five point one surround mix and then make a video towards it and so Ooh. we we took like one of those bbc filmers took nature nature stuff and made it into the best surround sound you can imagine wow. it was absolutely insane and the album that everybody denied went platinum the first day wow that's awesome yeah that was that's quite a story i mean we are very very i mean we are very very proud of that and everything they made afterwards went platinum or double platinum and everybody told them you have no chance no chance in hell you can put this music out and oh, the funny it. thing is the last one they renamed at one point to a german name uh, named lichtmond and the funny thing is the second lichtmond album actually has alan parsons on it Oh wow! But, but <laughs> he didn't. Great. He didn't mix it. He would. They asked him to sing on one of the songs. That's great. Was, yeah, that's awesome. So, were there any artists that um, you regret not signing, like that you took oh. a look at and you went, ah, nah, no thanks, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, something uh, huge happened? Um, funny enough, I'm. I have never been, um, regretting saying no to a band. But okay. there's a lot of a lot of contracts and bands that I wanted to pursue, but then either made a mistake, was outbid in the last moment, right, or something else came in the way. Um, okay. I was just I was just talking to my girlfriend the other day because we we're we were watching a concert um, from the the French band Gojira. Oh yeah. And their manager had had another band called Black Bomb A. And we we released their music in all of Europe except for France, and got them on tour everywhere. Okay. And then he was like, "Hey, I have this other band. It's a little bit smaller, but they are called Kujira. Would you like to sign them?" Right. And I said, and I looked them up, and I saw that the album was out for almost a year in France. And I said, "I really, really dig the band, but I think that album uh, I should skip on because it's already out for a year. I'm going to do the next one." Okay. And then he had to find someone else and he found Nuclear Blast uh -huh. in, in the US and then Nuclear Blast made it the album of the year in Metal Hammer. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a story I really, really regret. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'll happen sometimes, you know. I, I have a couple yeah, of those yeah, in my closet will. as well, you know. And one of them being, <laughs> I, one of them I, being I the band it. Chevelle, right? I, I, remember, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember getting the Chevelle demo and just you know, being into something else at the moment and just listening to it and going, okay, well, that's okay. But, you know, I'd rather work with whoever I went on to work with. And I, I passed on them. And, you know, because I at that point in time, I was getting, you know, six and seven offers almost every day, you know, and it was like, yeah, yeah can we work with this guy and that guy and this guy and that guy? And, you know, I just, it just fell under the radar. And, you know, then they went on to become the huge band that they are. And I was like, what? didn't I have their original demo? <laughs> yeah it's funny you know can you imagine like can you imagine in 2015 a friend called me and said that um that that one of his bands he has a label in the u.s that one of his band is going on tour in europe with chevelle and if okay. i could help out so i tour managed i tour managed the tour together with with chevelle and um for that other band and it's it was kind of funny because i i i the band was very, very small in Germany, so they okay. they could barely fill a eight hundred to a thousand capacity. Right. So I called the guy in Sony Music, who owned the music for Europe. Okay. And I, I and I said, "Hey, are you coming as well?" And he was like, "I've never heard of the band Chevelle." And then he listened to it, and then he came over, and then he was like, "What the fuck? I never know we had this band," <laughs> and he loved the concert. And then they came back, I think, two or three times already. Wow. Yeah, and that that's that. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely the the difference between the U.S. and 
Europe is crazy. Yes. One of the bands. This is this is one that I really regret. Okay. Because I really, really, really wanted to do Breaking Benjamin in Europe. Okay. Right. So, so, so nobody here knew about them. It was absolutely crazy. And I have a friend um, who is so connected with the U, uh, with the U.S. American um, alternative rock scene. He he got me ten bands without ever being an A and R or anything. Okay. And he said you have to check them out. Break and Benjamin started listening to them. I loved them to death. A friend of mine who's a DJ in a club said you have to you have to listen to them. they're absolutely amazing. And then I started talking to them. It was Hollywood Records, I think. Right. And it 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 um, it basically ended because the 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 manager and the label told me so the negotiations ended abruptly okay the, and the reason was he will not tour in europe because he doesn't want to fly benjamin okay and i was like i oh, all right and and then the whole stuff ended it never got released in the end they released it themselves in right. in europe I don't know which which distribution they used. Okay. But then they played at Rock and Ring Festival, which is also a hundred thousand people festival. Right. And they were playing, and the first fifty thousand people were singing along, and Ben was standing on stage, almost crying, holding a speech. I'm not wow. joking. Held a speech. He had no idea there was a world out there that knew about this band. And he would he would instantly come back, which they did, play two thousand capacity, which is a big venue size in in Europe because sure. all the cities are so close together. Right. So he played very big venues here, and he was just like, I'm, I, I'm, I have no idea you guys existed. And that's <laughs> that would have been that would have been such a great album to release or such a great cooperation. But I heard he doesn't want to fly, he doesn't want to tour in Europe. Wow. Well, there's, you know, there's That's always the a slow boat, as they say, you know, you can just take yeah. a cruise line over and, you know, from Florida all the way over to London or something, you know. I am absolutely sure they just made up an excuse. Uh, that's too bad for them, yeah. you know, missing out on all of that. And, you know, I know like from Europe, you know, we've talked about different concerts and venues and things like that. Well, they'll, you know, they'll go and like you said earlier, they'll put on a metal, a metal band and then they'll put on a polka band and then they'll put on a country band and then a whatever band and, and everybody stays rooted to where they are. You know, if you go to a festival, yeah. you can't even have a festival like that here in the States because nobody would go. They'd be too confused. Um, but, you know, it's, it's got to be a, a certain genre of music to have a festival go on here. You know, which I think is a little ludicrous because I like variety in my music, and to see a, a different variety of music at, at one festival would be awesome. You know, but yeah. so, what prompted you to go full time with your own label after all of that? Um. So, I had this very, very great time at at this. Um, it was basically a music label for DVDs. So we released a lot of DVDs, music DVDs. Right, and right. it was very successful. This Umbra project that I spoke about, the 5.1 surround sound was right. also a DVD. It was, it, it, it sold, it sold, it sold hundreds of thousands of DVDs at a time wow. when nobody was listening to music on DVDs. Okay. And, and, um, after that ended very abruptly because the <laughs> it's it's kind of funny but it's it's the truth that company was was so big they got okay. they they started making dvds they were they actually that company they were called mava film and media they okay. were the the first company to release a physical dvd in europe and and they signed everything they uh, did the biggest movies of that time and they made the mistake to always do deals for seven years. Okay. And then at one point, everybody realized how big of a business DVDs will be. Movie DVDs and film, film DVDs and, and nature DVDs and everything that we released. Right. I think we sold 500,000 copies of a campfire DVD. <laughs> and, and basically, if, if they had maybe, let's say, three or four years very good years where they signed everything and nobody else was on the train. The people started realizing 
and then the licenses got less and less okay even though they spent shit tons of money on on some of them right. i remember we spent 60 million on the distribution rights for ai from spielberg and oh, okay and it was absolutely crazy the, how big that company was right. but then three years later all the licenses ran out oh and and um yeah basically the company went from the company that released a thousand uh, top movies a year to the company that exploited shitty catalogs and right, okay. died literally died off wow it was it was they owned the 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 german soccer league so okay. the distribution rights for dvds for the german soccer league they made like little dv we made little dvds they were like 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 uh, like a business card dvd for okay. every player in the german soccer league oh, wow. so it was like an image film for every one of them and then we made dvds and gave them to the player so they can hand them out it was just the the company was so rich it's unbelievable yeah, it sounds Billions. like it. Yeah. yeah. And, you... and yeah. No, go, go and ahead. then I basically, oh, you, you, you asked me about uh, the switch. So, so that company died off. And right. then um, we were at that point, we were connected to Sony music distribution. Okay. And uh, I was on my way back from Berlin to Hamburg with the head of Sony music distribution. Uwe Lerch is his name. And we were we were sitting in the car talking. I had met him a couple of times, but I didn't know what kind of music he listened to. And he right. started he started the CD in his CD player as we were sitting and talking. And Slayer came out of out of the uh, out of the speakers, and I was like, "Is that Slayer?" And he was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Why are you into Slayer in your little suit?" And he was like, "You have no <laughs> idea who you're talking to, right?" And I was like, no. And I, then he said, have you ever heard about this little magazine called Rock Hard Magazine? And I was like, yeah, it's like the metal hammer just in, in, right. in, in Europe. And he said, I started that, that uh, magazine to, uh, oh, wow. 25 okay. years ago. And he had a TV show on German TV called Mosh TV. So he okay. was basically known as the metal guy in Europe. And uh, I, was just, I was just not aware of it. And then we talked for the whole three hour trip back. And we, he asked me about my own label that I was mainly concentrating before I worked for that music DVD company. And he said, Hey, if you had the chance to distribute like professionally, would you do it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I would. And then he said, so give me a call if you ever need a distribution deal. And then that's how I left the, how I left the the um the the car ride basically and okay maybe a month later a friend of mine came to me and said do you have an idea for a label and here's my demo and it was a great album and i instantly signed the band i called the guy I said hey did uh, were you joking and he was like no and then i released my first real distributed cd on sony music it sold two oh. copies in the first day two Congratulations. Not 200, too. <laughs> <laughs> could have been worse, <laughs> but it, it could, could have, have been, been better, one. too. <laughs> yes, or none. You know, that would have sucked. <laughs> yeah, that was not a great start. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, what did it go on to sell? You remember? Oh, God, the first album, maybe I would say, because it was only Germany, maybe like six, 800, something like that. Okay. And then the second album came out, which was just an EP, sold a little bit more. But then the third album made a jump to three thousand, which was for a little for a little hardcore metal band. It was very respectable, but not Absolutely. not not a million. Right. But right. it was but it then, was it know, was good. There's there's different levels of success, you know, depending on exactly. who you are, what your goals are, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, you can have. I think everybody starts out with some grandiose ideas of, you know, they get a guitar at you know, guitar center or whatever. And yeah. I'm going to be a rock star. I got this when I was seven and they start playing and they get really good. And, you know, but maybe they can't write songs or something. So they have some of their friends come over and they start writing songs together and so on and so forth. But, but I'm sure in the back of all of these kids minds, I'm going to be a friggin' rock star. I'm going to be as huge as 
boom, whoever their idols are, right? And that's again, that's great. I love that because that 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 breeds dreams and hopes, and you know, I'm going to make myself better, and that kind of an attitude, right? So, but then along the way, you know, there becomes this disconnect, right? Somebody decides that you know they go off with a girl or whatever, and then life starts and they have a baby, et cetera, and, uh, you know, or whatever. And then, or this kid goes to college and they never see each other again and, you know, whatever happens. Right. Um, and then life takes over, you know, and, and we just go about what we do. But I think that, you know, that initial passion, when you pick up your first instrument is like, Oh yeah, I could play this. I'm going to be really great at this, you know? And, and that's the kind of stuff that I look for in an artist for sure. You know, like the hunger, like, are you, yeah. are you hungry enough to play and do what it takes to make some great music, you know? And what is great music? Like, you know, I, I have this opinion that there's only two kinds of music, good and bad, right? Uh -huh. And so, but bad music, that's just a subjective opinion of, of my own, right? It's not, it doesn't reflect on your, your opinion whatsoever of what bad music might be or good music, right? But I do know that there's a big gap between American and European artists, and I'd like to like see that closed down and have more European artists influenced in America and vice versa over in Europe. Right. Because, you know, I know Europeans just love entertainment. Right. You know, when yeah. I've, when I've traveled to Europe and gone to these big festivals, like I said earlier, you know, they have very, a lot of different genres of bands on the same bill and sometimes even playing in the same field together, you know, depending on the show, obviously. So how, how do you close the, that gap? Any ideas? <laughs> I mean, it is it is um, it is easier for for Americans because um, Americans have the power of politics. If if the if the head of if the head of America Recordings said we have this band here from Los Angeles called System of a Down, and this will be the next big thing, it will be the next big thing. Then Sony Music, okay. uh, Columbia in Germany says, yes, Mr. Rubin, we do it, of course. And then uh, it happens. Okay. And with System of a Down, it took four singles before right. any, any, anybody took a hold of them. And um, okay. where everybody would have dropped the band in, in today's time, it was a political decision. Mr. Rick Rubin does not release a not working album. And, oh, okay. and, and so Sony music in Germany put everything up their heart to make this work. And gotcha. it was a great album. It was, uh, it, it, it hit the spot. He was, he was right. Sony music was, was right to follow him, but that, that thing doesn't work the other way around. Like I have every, every single band that I signed as a manager to a label. We signed uh -huh. an, a deal for America, and except for one, none ever actually got released. Oh, wow. Okay. It's absolutely crazy because some of the bands are very, very big here and, and never got released in the United States. And I have actually heard um, deciding people in American labels say, every band that you bring me from Europe, I got ten uh, in in New York alone, and it's probably uh, probably okay. right. It's probably right. right. So why would you why would you um, take an owl and bring it to Greece, as as we say in Germany, if you right. if 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 you if you have all the bands right there, and if you want to send them on tour, you don't always have to pay for the flights. So yeah, it is it is very difficult, but. Um, that okay. is something that I tried to achieve a little bit by, um, because I am I'm a huge fan of of American music. I I always I always say to people when 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 we talk about you that probably a third of everybody's CD rack at home is made by you, and and, <laughs> and it, it it is I know it's true for me. It is it is absolutely true. So okay. So I mean, for example. My big dream would have been take a seven dust and bring them into Europe because nobody right. ever did. Nobody ever did. Right. And, and I know they toured, they toured with Skunk and Nancy here and I was at that show and then they did another tour. Right. And, but, but that never, I, I, I think 
they might actually be playing bigger shows here right now because the people are so thirsty for that band. I think they Absolutely. could they could fill they could fill fifteen hundred or two thousand people. Ex right. An example is Machine Head, who plays five and a half oh, yeah. thousand people in 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 London at the uh, not the Astoria but in the I forgot the name of the of the venue where they always play, and five and a half thousand people. And then they go to San Francisco and and play five hundred. Right. It's it's right. it's so there is a way f that leads that direction, but I mean in in the case of Machine Head, it's definitely the work of Roadrunner here in Europe. They were so fucking strong. Right. They were right. a, a great label here. So I guess what you're saying is, if if I'm an American band and I want to break out globally. And, you know, I have to have a, a label that's very well rooted in those regions. Right. And then, I th yeah, you know, I, th I think the clever sounds like to be successful. I think I think either you have a you have a, a label that has subsidies in every in every territory you want to tour. Right. Uh, or you need to be careful about the territories you sign your your rights away because because uh, okay. labels like my old label would have signed a a a break in Benjamin instantly, but the rights were uh -huh. with Hollywood Records. Right. Okay. And that happens all the time. Right. There was no way to get them here. So uh -huh. so I say as I said, uh, and it it rarely rarely happens that you sign a worldwide deal and then someone comes and says, "Hey, we want to work with this band, but we are in Japan." It rarely bans so that the label gives you the right back. Right. Okay. They sometimes say, "Hey, okay, maybe we can make the deal and license it out." Right. That's that would be a gift, but most of the time they say we plan to do it ourselves, and then they never do. Right. Okay. It's all about money. <laughs> it's all about. It, it, I think I actually don't even think it's about money. I think it's about about capacities. Oh, okay. Understanding markets. I cannot. I cannot expect. I cannot expect. I had I had this conversation literally two years ago when I was talking about a tour from for an American band, and I presented them with uh, seven shows to have them tour the first headlining tour in Europe. And the guy the guy was from Chicago, and he came back to me and said, "We would like to see some bigger cities." Right. Okay. And I said I had to say to him, "This is literally the biggest cities you can play in Germany." This is the biggest cities that there are, and those cities are, are are literally as it's like playing San Francisco, New York, Chicago, um, I don't know Austin and L.A. Okay, San Diego. Right. So so, but he was like, we would like to see some more bigger cities, but I cannot expect a guy sitting in Chicago to know what the biggest concert cities in Germany are. So they don't understand it, so they they don't have any interest. Right. Okay. The band came over, and the band played their first headlining tour in Europe, and they sold out half of the venues. Oh, okay. And Good. they went home happy. Right. Of course. Their first tour almost broke even. Can you imagine that? That's pretty crazy, right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because most don't even come close. Well, being a, a, a music business guru, it must have been easy for you to start your own uh, Guitar Center podcast, right? Discussing topics like making money in the music business. What else did you advise your audience on? Um, I we we we, we kind of did that, yes. Um, <laughs> we 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 did have have a pod. I had a I have a friend that I used to make podcasts with. He he was from the music business as well, and he. Um, he was actually the guy, the guy who who worked on the first original Cubase. Oh, sweet! And and so he he's a he's a he's a great friend of mine. He went over to work with Yamaha later. Okay. And then basically for the German European version of Guitar Center called Thoman. Ah, okay. And we did a podcast series, and my role there was. Um, the calculator man. Ah. So we would always put up a scenario and then basically, basically say who would make what money, where would the money go? Okay. And then, and then everybody cried a little, and then we <laughs> we tried to <laughs> to find some tweaks to to make some money back. <laughs> Understood. So that yeah, was 
All right. Who are some of your guests? Oh, we had, uh, I mean, in the interviews, we had some, some very major guests there. We, I mean, we're talking, one of my best interviews I did for that podcast was um, with Nickelback. Oh, wow. It was amazing. Super nice guys. Yep. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. We had Slash in there, um, sweet Rush, Getty Lee. Oh wow! So um, a lot of a lot of big heroes. I, I don't remember half of them. Uh, Zach Wild, My Chemical Romance, Billy Talent. Oh great! A lot okay. of a lot of. Uh, I did uh, Airborne twice and got the same answers. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> always... <laughs> That's always the answer fun. was always rock and roll. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the answer was always rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was good. It was also. Um, we had we had different different series. We had some shortcuts where we we had like guys like um, Papa Roach and Cold Chamber. Okay. So, um, oh god, I don't remember. And then um, we had those those more business-like interviews and there we basically went to to industry people so right, we had okay. a lot of german a lot of german people there we had a couple of international guys we had the um the head of head of rock from roadrunner in okay. in one of the interviews so he would answer some questions i don't know do we have any producers i don't know i don't think so it's been a while but that's okay yeah, it seems like now you're more into the management side of artists. So, what made you go in that direction? Uh, money. <laughs> oh, that's a big <laughs> yeah, motivator. Yeah. Very, very simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 in 2012, I I stopped what is now the old label. Okay. Because it, there there wasn't any money left. Right. And the label business, you you couldn't have any money except you exploited people. Okay. I could have gone and gave gave the gave the bands three hundred and sixty deals, right. but i i always I always tried to, to avoid that as as much as I could. But that's just how you make money nowadays as a label, right? Exactly. But back in the day, I didn't, and I I used to work with a band um, back in the days that um, that came from from. Uh, the guys from the American band called Orgy. Oh yeah, okay. And so I worked with those guys, and it was a really great friendship, and it was very, very successful. We did a, a lot of tours, and it felt more like a, almost like a brotherhood. Sure. So I, so I felt so frustrated about the label business that I basically stopped that and gave the promise to the band that I would work full time for them. Gotcha. And then, okay. um, and then I started managing them, and then a couple of other bands came on. That was a that was actually a very great example because we distributed ourselves. Oh. We did everything ourselves. We were absolutely one hundred percent independent, oh, yeah. and we made we made good money that way. It's not that I mean I remember the first album came out on Metropolis, and um, as far as I know, they they lost a shit ton of money on that. And then the second album came out and made fifteen thousand profit on one show the first night, wow. because we were selling the CDs independently at the Roxy. We were just everybody okay. who came in bought a CD, and that's how we how we sold seven hundred and fifty CDs the first day. That's great. Good way yeah, to do it. it. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah, I I believe so. Yeah, I think so too. That sounds you know you always have to have a, a, a slightly different angle. You know, and yeah. that, that's one of them. You know, what did you two do? They did, uh, you know, they made a deal with Apple Music. And then when the new iPhone came out, they put it all on like this thing just yes. came with your phone. And then they wanted to have credit for every phone that was sold because it had their album on it. Yeah, meow, absolutely. Meow, 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 fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's always, but it was always, a good angle. always new ways. <laughs> it was a it was a great idea. I mean, uh, I, I have this. I have this talk that I give bands when it's about about okay. situations like the U2, and I always call it a generational contract. Okay. So when when um, Jimi Hendrix basically was pushed by the label because he had uh, he had the money that I don't know some band in the in the twenties made, 
and then okay. Jimi Hendrix money was used, or maybe the Beatles. So the money from the Beatles, not the same label, I understand that, but right. maybe the money that a label made with, with the Beatles was used to push Jimi Hendrix. And then Jimi Hendrix money was used to push, I don't know, Nine Inch Nails. And then right. Nine Inch Nails money was used to, no, that it was it went into Madonna. And then Madonna money was used to push Nine Inch Nails. And then Trent Reznor decided to sell his music directly. Right. And there was okay. no money left for the label. And then the money couldn't sign new bands. That's the generational contract that I always talk about. And as much as I, as much as I, I know it's shameful as much as I like you too, as a, as a band, because they make a lot of people very happy and they made yes. a lot of very, very songs that mean a lot of songs that mean a lot to people. I, I have the utmost respect for them. And I have, I have worked with a band who is friends with the guys and says okay. they are the most amazing people that they fund all of Dublin and they, they make sure. sure that everybody has their money and everything. Right. But the generational contract is those 55 million that went to to all the iPhone users right. to you two never landed at the pocket of someone who would support new music. Right. And Agreed. that's that's yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily great because it's their job. Their job is to make money. No, no, I, I think I, that I said, cats I, are very I happy. agree, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not it, it's it's greed on the part of Apple, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. but not on the part of the yeah. band, because the band is just trying to, you know, do what they do, right? And they spend X yeah, amount of exactly. dollars to make that record. And so Apple came along and said, We're gonna give you X amount of dollars to put this record, you know, on these phones. And then Apple came, you know, came and took all the money, right? So the generational money you talk about stopped right with Apple and it went to make more of these silly computers or whatever. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So it, it's not getting, you know, referred back into the music industry as, as your generational contract would have. Do you, I, I just remember because talking about it always makes me remember things. I remember what broke me in the label business. Oh, what was that? It was it was it it was it was the moment I talked to a guy who, if you're not in, not living in Europe or Germany, you, you don't know. But there's this one company um, called Saturn. They are okay. the the number one record store, electronic store you had back in the day. Okay. And I I went up to the guy who does who's who's buying the the key account, and I said, Hey man, why why are all the the, the space for CDs and vinyls. Why is it disappearing? Right. And he looked me in the eye and he said, you know what, Daniel? It is disappearing because I need the space to sell uh, hard disk drives where the people who download your music from the internet save your music for free. Wow. That broke me because there was so much, there was so much knowledge in that sentence. Absolutely. He basically he basically told me, dude, you're outdated. Yep. As a label, you are absolutely outdated. The people get it from the internet and they save it on a hard disk drive. Right. And it's all for free. And it's all for free. Yikes. Yeah. Most of the time <laughs> people get involved in the music business because of their passion for music, right? So yeah. let's go a little bit off the clock. And who are some of your favorite bands you listen to when, when you're not working? Mm. For pleasure. For pleasure. It, it changed. It changed vastly. I started with music that um, was new and crazy. So okay. I started, um, I mean, originally I started with Nick Kershaw. And, okay. I, and for 35 years, I never was able to see him play live. And I oh. saw him a year and a half ago and I got to talk to him and it was absolutely oh, amazing. I flew from Finland to Hamburg to see okay. him and then flew back directly the next day just oh, to wow. have a chance to see him. And um, that was just amazing. Then I went into Michael Jackson. Then I went into my Goss time. So I listened to a lot of The Cure, a lot of Sisters of Mercy. And all okay. of those bands still stayed with me. Then I had my, my let's say, power rock time when I went into Bon Jovi and maybe a little bit of ZZ Top. And okay. um, and then it started, then my metal time started, went full on Metallica. Oh, and, nice. and from there, 
I went into the whole new metal scene. Favorite band of that of all the time. It's not a new metal band, but that's crazy, super mechanical. You know, this whole syncopated right. and and no life la- life in the machine. You know, right, uh, right. bands, uh, quantized bands, Meshuggah. Absolutely, oh. I, I can I can I can hum every riff on the first seven albums. Oh, without wow. without awesome. without without ever making a mistake no matter how crazy they are because I listen to every one of them a million times that's great. and I still I still I still have them in my heart but then a couple of years ago probably around the time when I left my label I went full on my mother's music I remember I remember sitting in a cafe and thinking this would be the perfect moment to check out Pink Floyd and ah. I started listening to Wish You Were Here. And okay. since that day, whenever I go to Germany and, and home, I always have have to have to listen to that album. I will sit down somewhere with a coffee and just look in look look, I don't know, at a river or whatever it is and just enjoy an hour for myself. That's great. So that's that's music that I that I really enjoy. Led Zeppelin, definitely. And then my mom, she was she was a way bigger influence in my music taste than i than i knew but okay she she was she was in bars and and clubs while she was pregnant with me and excellent <laughs> and all that music stayed with me for some reason i mean there was a time when i when i watched the movie tommy when i was like i don't know eight and i watched it every day for a year okay so that's how i how i grew up with the who and all these bands right right i called my mom when i when i was hanging out with ellen parsons oh and i she, and I beat it. she was she was absolutely astonished it was crazy i don't I know if she, I, I i assume she was crying a little but i sent her a hey. photo and everything it was it was very cute that's great yeah. so did you ever have your own band oh yeah 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 oh okay yeah you want to tell us a little bit about that yeah, I mean that that's what what started it all. I wanted to be a rock star. I See? wanted to be yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to rule the world and be I don't know, like Metallica back in the days when right, I was okay. into Metallica. So I I think my first band I started in 93 we had the the amazing name of the Junk Beatles on our first night. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And then yeah, we had it for exactly one one day. And then um Okay. It was it was it was a fun ride. I think we stopped in two thousand and four. So yeah, eleven years. Eleven years. Okay. You have a lot of fun. How many records do you make? One? Um seven. We made three albums and one EP. And okay. the last the last album never got released because we got a new singer and he became a rock star before he was a rock star. So he took oh, on the the rock a lot of those. Yeah, he took on the rock star life <laughs> with a lot of with a lot of uh, skiing, as we called it. And oh yeah, and I, yes. <laughs> we recorded the whole. I I remember all of that stuff because it's like that's that's the pain of my life. Uh, right. I we recorded the whole album in about a month, except for the vocals. Okay. We were signed back then. We were signed to Sony Music and Mercury Records. So universal oh, nice and uh, we, we recorded the whole album in in a little bit less than a month but we had zero vocals and then we took 11 months to finish the vocals which never wow. happened i mean on and off right so we weren't sure. in the studio for for a year but sometimes we had to take a break for three months because he disappeared or he was in therapy or something like that and then after that time i told the guy from the studio because he wanted the next batch of money and i said right. we used all of it <laughs> right and exactly then i went back to the labels and said i don't think it's gonna happen and uh, that's what happened and then we had a we had a let's say uh a, a leap year where basically none of that stuff i remember and okay. then we tried again for one day 
and it ended in a disaster and an absolute disaster with us basically almost fighting on stage oh and boy. then um <laughs> yeah and then uh and over we literally i'm not joking we knew it was over and then the whole band destroyed the whole equipment right on stage nirvana style and just left oh wow and i haven't touched the guitar between that time and probably two years ago wow yeah that's actually a sad story it is it is very sad <laughs> you know with all the anger and violence that goes oh, into you breaking have, yeah. instruments you know yeah, yeah. That's, it was, that's pretty it, sad though it was absolutely so, crazy yeah I, I i gave my guitars away to friends and everything and wow. uh, I, I actually still have one of those boxes here because a friend of mine just sent me one of my guitars back he was in just pieces? like maybe uh, huh? in pieces no 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 it's 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 absolutely big because back in the day i okay. i I didn't use it anymore, so I, I gave it to him so he could try and play with it. Oh, and then he had it I for gotcha. probably 10 years, probably longer. Gotcha. Okay. And That's then awesome. just maybe two months ago, he sent it back. And now it's right That's there. Sweet. <laughs> awesome. And so you still play, obviously, now, right? A little bit? Uh, maybe a little bit sometimes, but I don't tell people about it. Yes. We but it's, 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 so... it's, it, but, but leaving all of that behind made me hate my own music so much that ah, okay. that but it also motivated me to make other people have success i wanted i wanted to be a i always I, when i talk to people i always use it they always think i make a joke but i always say i want to be a stain on your career i want you to look ah, back okay. and remember me as the guy who did something that stayed in your pants, like a stain on your pants or something. Right. So, okay. so I, I try my whole life basically to make other people happy and, and live their career that I never had. Understood. I, I, I know that feeling well <laughs> in many different areas of my life. Yeah. So, so speaking of hidden stuff and all that and secrets here at my right stuff, I like to have fun and get a little bit more personal with my guests. And, and I know everybody has some, so can you tell me what hidden talents you might have in Mr. Calculator? Hidden talent. Oh God. A hidden talent, Mr. Calculator. Hmm. I can actually play the nose pipe. <laughs> I don't know if you know what that a is. A nose pipe. I yes. don't know. What is a nose pipe? I wish I had it here. It's a little plastic thing you put over your mouth and your nose, and then you blew, okay. blow into it with your nose. And I can, and you, and you make music and you can make music with kind? this. Yes. It's funny. <laughs> and I have my nose pipe <laughs> that I have. I have it since I was a kid, probably seven or eight. It's still the same nose pipe. It has a little D scratched in. So nobody would steal it from me. That's great. I'd love to have a picture of that. So I can put it right in this podcast right here. <laughs> I can send it to um, you because I... it's on my desk at home. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not joking. It's one of the few things. That I, that I still have and I have it since I'm six or seven not joking oh wow I'll That's send it great. I send That's you an great. email later <laughs> yes please do please do but, well, but that's awesome Daniel but otherwise I try to I try to learn uh, uh things that I never managed to learn as a kid like the Rubik's Cube there was a time when I was really oh, okay. good at the Rubik's Cube but that's gone right. now Can you do it one-handed or no no, no 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 I I take that, that, two or three minutes, but uh, it it was it was okay because as a kid I could never learn it. It was always fascinating to me. Yeah, me too. I could. I, I'm not good at that at all. Like, and then I see kids like you know one handed like all yeah. by itself. It does it. Yeah, but for example, Crazy. this is this is my 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 old Pot Pro, the Line Six Pot Pro, that I actually okay. bought because when I when I left my band, I sold right. mine. I sold my original oh. one. And now since I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't care anymore. I, I buy all my old stuff back. All the stuff I used to own when I was a kid, I buy it back. That's great. That's great. <laughs> they can get that old tone back. I yeah, like I, I don't even know if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give a big My Right Stuff thank you to my guest, Daniel Heardman. 
And this was definitely one of the most informative and educational podcasts, <laughs> but we also had a bunch of fun and, you know, a bunch of stories. And thank you, Daniel, for taking the time to be part of this episode. I really hey, appreciate it's, it. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure for me. Thank you very much. It's amazing. My pleasure. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal, helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer. You can find this piece of gold at tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. And remember, we now have our very own My Right Stuff store. So please head on over to myrightstuff.com and click on the store tab and pick up some hot merch and some snazzy garb for those lovely bodies. Show us your love by tagging us in a picture of you wearing or using any of our swag on Facebook or Instagram, and we'll mention you in one of our episodes. And of course, be sure to subscribe to both our YouTube channel and the podcast channel of your choice so you never miss a single episode. I hear it'll also give you 10 years good luck. (laughs) Ring that bell for the notifications. And this has been another exciting episode of My Right Stuff. Be sure to tune in next week and every week to get your fix. I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright. And remember to keep listening loud, playing hard, and keep reaching for your dreams. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much. All righty. And have a good night. Thank you for watching My Right Stuff. This episode was brought to you by Tone natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tomes.com that's www.taumhoms.com